Good morning. All together now. That's an expression you'll hear. <laughs> yeah, if you're going to, like if you get a group together and you're going to sing a song, we'll say, all together now, and you'll sing, I don't know, happy birthday or whatever it is, right? Do you ever think about that? How often are we all together now? Like in the modern era with our abilities to stay in touch with the rest of the world, how often when we are together in the same geography are we actually all together? Because I think it feeds this ability to have whatever you want, whenever you want, feeds this ability, this need to have it your way. That and Burger King, of course, have it your way, right? This has really encouraged us that we should have it our way. Uh, I didn't get permission for this, but I'm going to share it anyway. I get a little chuckle. The hours that I am at school, I'm not there all day, but the hours that I am there, right outside my classroom door is where Mr. Strunk gathers the phys ed classes. That would be Andrew to you and me. And every hour that I'm there, I hear Andrew say, okay, today we're going to play whatever, let's say volleyball. And instantly, but I want to play soccer, but I want to play kickball, but I want to play nine square, but I want to play gaga ball, but I, can we just play this? Can I just walk around in a circle? Like, <laughs> they're in one place, but they're not all together. And it's, you would think now, it's that we have like three weeks left of school. You would think by now they have figured it out. No, we're going to do what the class does. <laughs> and yet, but I want to do what I want to do, and I've been able to strong arm and threaten three other people, so now they want to do the same thing that I want to do. I don't actually think they do that, but, right? So I found three other people that want to do what I want to do instead of what you want to do, right? It's what we do. Everybody has their own idea. And God did create us to be imaginative, creative, independent thinkers, and there's a, certainly a time and a place for that. And there's also a time and a place where we need to get all together now. Right? Specifically when we're talking about theological things, we need to get all together. It is so hard. Have you noticed this? Try to schedule a meeting with like four people. Or even two people. And then actually have it finish and happen the way it's supposed to happen. It's becoming, I don't know what we're doing that has us so busy all the time, but gracious, I mean, to get everybody on the same page is a struggle, right? Have you seen this, or is it just me? Like, just to get everybody on the same page, here's what we're going to do. None of you, not here, of course, but just outside of these doors, you know, we throw out Cinco de Mayo Mancho de taco, and everyone's like, sign me up. Tacos, let's have it. There are some things that are universal. Tacos and Jesus, though, you know, not in that order, right? Getting everybody on the same page, though, is really hard. Last week, we started talking about stories and how there is a much bigger story than ourselves and what and that we would do well to make sure that our story stays connected to God's bigger story. We also learned that our story, after I told you that our story is very small compared to God's story, I also told you that your very small story is a featured part of God's story. Just because your part's small doesn't mean it's inconsequential. In fact, it's very important that each one of us do our part in the big story so that God's big story gets done the way God wants it to be done. And he gives us, in my opinion, a little bit too much freedom in our little story, because we get to decide how our little story plays out. We get to decide whether or not we're going to be a part of his big story, or if we're just going to stick with our little story and ad-lib the whole thing and just kind of see how it goes. And sadly, I haven't done an exhaustive research, but it seems to me like that's what most people are doing. They're just sort of ad-libbing life as it goes and trying to figure it out rather than trying to hook into in God's bigger story. 
God's desire for us, you see it all over the Bible, God's desire is for us to find unity with all of our little stories when we're connected to his big story. And in that, we find unity and togetherness, and we all get, as they say, on the same page. So in a world that is fragmented by division and discord, Ephesians chapter 2 is a word of hope for us, for the opportunity that there might be reconciliation for all who are called by his name. What is it that keeps us so busy? What is it that separates us from one another? To understand that, we need to start at the beginning of Ephesians chapter 2. And yes, I'll go ahead and warn you, we're going to do the whole chapter today, but it's not that long. So, and it's really good. I tried to pare it down and no, it's just that good. So if you would like to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Let's remember just a couple things from last week about Ephesians. This is Paul wrote this letter to the church in Ephesus. We talked last week about the multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-language, multicolor. Ephesus was sort of a slice of humanity, right? They had a little bit of everything. And they also had every religion that was known in that part of the world at that time. They had everything. So, again, as I said last week, they were the island of misfit toys. They had everything. And in this, Paul is writing to them and saying, we should be unified in Christ. And so let's remember, he's writing to a church now, so he's talking to people who, have, who believe in Jesus. It doesn't matter where they came from, what, what religious background they came from, what language, what culture. They believe in Jesus now, and he's saying, but wait, remember there was a time when you too were apart from God and you were people of wrath. So you're living among all of these people who are not glorifying God. They don't believe in Jesus. They're doing their own thing and they're not living according to God's word. You were like that once too. We just have to be patient is what he's saying. We were all there at one time. Part of human nature is self-centeredness. In fact, you could say we are all unified in our self-centeredness. That's one thing that all of us have in common. Sorry if I'm stepping on anybody's toes, but I'm just telling you the way it is. That's something we all at least had in common before Jesus got hold of us. Self-centeredness. We are unified in that, which is ironic and self-defeating because self-centeredness destroys unity. It's kind of the opposite of unity, because it's not about bringing people together, it's about making people individuals, and I should have it my own way, right? Self-centeredness is what separates us from God and from one another. All of us know it, all of us have it, and all of us live with it. Everyone at some point has to come to a crisis moment, a moment when they realize in their life that they are broken and lost and a mess, and having everything our way, as delightful as that seems, and the lie of that allure, doesn't work. Getting everything exactly the way you want it doesn't fix anything. In fact, it makes most things worse. In other words, don't get all hopeless on me because what I'm about to say is good news. What we need is a savior. We need Someone who can pull us together in a common goal, in commonality. People respond to this in one of two ways. Many deny it and they'll reject him. And others will realize what is happening and willingly cry out to the Lord and say to him, I need to change. It's private, it's personal, but... We have a personal God who knows us and loves us before we ever loved him. 
or even recognized him at all. He was coming after us. Verse 4, Ephesians 2. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. This isn't a particularly pleasant thought, but maybe you've heard this. There was a movie about 30 years ago that came out talking about this. When someone is sentenced to be executed and they're on their way to be executed, they refer to that as dead man walking because he's on his way. I say he, you know, that person is on their way to the end. They made a movie about it, Sarah Susan Sarandon. I never saw it. I don't know if it's any good or not. So I'm not recommending it. But the concept is interesting. Dead man walking. There's this obsession now. It's been around for about 15 years with zombies. I don't know why. I don't get into that either. But like it's all the rage, zombie apocalypse, whatever. Dead people walking around. I don't know what's up with that. But (laughs) without Christ, that's what we are. We can look good on the outside. We can look like we have it all put together. We can look like we are successful. We can look like we are prosperous. But if the Spirit of the Lord does not live within you, you are dead inside. You are dead in your transgressions. What he's saying to us there, what Paul is meaning by that, is you might look good on the outside, but our lives hold no meaning, and they certainly hold no future. And therefore, they have no real hope. But in Christ, not only do we gain eternal an eternal future, but we also, through the Holy Spirit living in us, become more alive in the way that we, are, we present our lives to the world. We become alive in the present. By grace, he says, you have been saved. Saved from what? Well, saved from being the living dead and the fear of eternal death. Saved for what? Well, saved to proclaim the good news of Jesus to everyone. He chose us, you and me, individually. We didn't choose him. The things we do in no way, if we do good works, that in no way obligates God to give us a good life. That in no way obligates God to give us salvation. It's simply a response that we have of thanksgiving for what we've been given. To do the things that God has given us to do, He saved us on His own. We couldn't do that. As a reflection of that, we do good things in return. All right? God instigated, God fulfilled. What we do is respond with gratitude. I'm going to jump down a little bit to verse 10. Ephesians 2, verse 10. For we are God's handiwork, Created in Christ Jesus to do, good, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I love this word, handiwork. I speak about this as often as I can because I love it. It means masterpiece in Greek. The word implies that we're not just something God made, like a sandwich or a paper airplane. Like we are something that God took some time And put some of himself into it. A work of art. We are God's artwork. And to be God's artwork means that we are something different today than it did. Actually, it means something different for us now than it did back then. So let me talk about that a little bit. When we say that we're God's art, we imagine when we think of art something that is for our visual enjoyment or for our entertainment. Right? We think movies, you know, paintings, beautiful things. We appreciate them like objects or a a work of, if it's a, a song or a play, it's a work of art that we statically observe and enjoy. That's what we think of art. But prior to the 1700s, art was typically more purposeful for that. People made tools as a form of art. To give us some perspective, you might consider, think of a a very well-crafted automobile as a work of art. I know in this room that's hard for you to, like, wrap your heads around a really well-crafted automobile to be a work of art. But you see what I'm saying? It's not just an object. It's meant to be used, right? That's what that word implies when he says we are God's handiwork. We are something that was made 
very, very carefully, very deliberately for a purpose, right? So what's my point? Well, look at the rest of verse 10. He said, created to do good works. Not only are we God's masterpiece, but we are God's masterpiece made on purpose for a purpose. God created us with work to do. And those works are not for us. They're not for us to do alone also. They are for us to do as a pack. We do them together. That's the idea of this word. It's not everybody. We like this idea in our culture. We're so even, um, individualistic. that We think it's all about me. and What am I going to do? Well, it's not the way it is in God's kingdom. It's what are we going to do? And everybody, it, again, like an automobile, not everybody is a fuel injector. And not everybody is, you know, a piston or even an engine or whatever. There are all these parts are supposed to be brought together. And only when they're all brought together does the real work get done. You following what I'm saying? So this whole rugged individualism that we have in the West really is anti-biblical. It doesn't work with what God has for us. So Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 13. Therefore, remember that formerly you were, I'm sorry, you who were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. All right, so he's talking in this section, he's talking very specifically to the people who are part of the church at Ephesus who were not of a Jewish background. And they were meant to think, meant to believe that they were somehow less. They had lower value than the people who had been raised Jewish. And they got that idea because the people who had been raised Jewish told them so. Without any restraint, I believe. They were pretty clear in smashing down the Gentiles, from what I have learned from the Bible. And so Paul is saying, listen... No, don't listen to them, listen to me. Listen to God. What God said is, you were once separate, but now we are together. We are one church. This passage reminds us of our past state of alienation from God and from one another. Before Christ, we were separate, separated, living in darkness. Having the look of faithfulness. This is the thing. The Jewish people, that reason he talks about circumcision right here, he's talking about the Jewish people had the look of faithfulness. They were circumcised. But that lacked the depth. All right? They looked good. They had the symbol on them that said they were faithful, but their lives were not faithful. It's like a beautiful car without an engine. Am I working this too hard? It's like a beautiful car without an engine. Looks good, but it ain't going anywhere. And that's not what a car is for. It's not meant to be a giant paperweight in the garage. It's supposed to be at work. All right? So that's what he's saying. Now, that's a pretty strong conviction of the Jewish people. He said they looked good, but they lacked any depth of faith. They lacked the heart. Everything was a meaningless ritual. Okay? So... In John 13, 35, he said, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. All right? Through the sacrificial love of Jesus Christ, we have been brought near to God. This reconciliation not only restores our relationship with the Father, but also unites us with one another. In Christ, there is no room for division or discrimination. That's the point he's making. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done. What matters is what you're going to do from here forward. In Christ, we are one. It doesn't mean that your past is completely irrelevant because our experiences in life make us who we are. The things we learn, the things we do, the things we see. 
we bring that richness into our faith. What he's saying is there is no discrimination. It doesn't matter. We are all in the fruit salad, so to speak. Some fruitier than others, but we are all in the fruit salad together. You with me? Ephesians 2, verse 14. Back to Ephesians. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one. He has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile them, both of them, to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. The two, Jews and Gentiles. Basically, it's a little harsh, but what he's saying is, I'm not particularly thrilled with either one of those groups. <laughs> but when we are one all together, and when we embrace one as being one all together, now we're getting somewhere. That pleases Jesus, all right? So why is he talking so much about the differences now between Jews and Gentiles? If he's talking about making peace between them, what Paul is doing here is he's reminding them that was the job from the beginning. He's talking to those who God had specifically called and those who God expected the called to call. Did I say that in a way that makes sense? The Jews were supposed to go out and let the whole world know that God loved them and God wanted them. And instead, the Jews used the law that God gave them and said, Oh, look at us. We're so good. You're not like us. Don't you feel bad? That's a paraphrase. I don't, that's not in the Bible. But you, you get the idea. Right? It's what they were doing. We would call them, in the house I grew up in, hoity-patoity. They were very impressed with themselves. God, however, not impressed. God was not so impressed. In fact, he was not amused. Verse 17. He came and he preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. This is the heart of the gospel. Jesus made peace. He removed the hostility between Jews and Gentiles. He removed any possibility of there being ins and outs. In the same way, he tears down any barrier that separates all kind of people groups today, whether it's by race or ethnicity or social status or even denominations. All followers of Christ, as followers of Christ, we are called to celebrate what we have in common and embrace one another as equals, united in our shared identity as children of God. You understand what I'm saying? doesn't matter where you came from. What matters is where we're going. And we are united in our identity as children of God. I said last week or the week before, adopted as sons. Not adopted as random children, but specifically adopted with all of the special treatment and all of the special benefits that only sons got in that culture. Everybody, Jew, Gentile, male, female, daughter, son, slave, free, rich, poor, everybody gets adopted into the kingdom of God with all the same benefits that a son would be adopted into a Roman home. That has been radical for them. In a world where everything is about your station and about your status in life, you've ever felt like you're not good enough? Jesus says, you are. Well, actually, Jesus says, you're not. But it's okay. I'm your guy. So if you ever talk to anybody about faith, and they say, I could never be good enough to be a Christian, all you got to say is, I know a guy. And there you have it. Because Jesus takes everybody the island of misfit toys. John 17, 20 and 21 says, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. He's talking about, first of all, he prays about, this is Jesus, and he's praying to God in John 17, getting up to this. He prays for himself, he prays for his disciples, and then he starts praying for the people who will hear the message of his disciples. 
for the people who don't even, haven't even heard about him yet. He's praying for them in John 17, 20. He says, I pray also for those who will believe in me through the message of my disciples, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Don't miss what this says. Jesus prayed that all who would ever follow him, anyone who would ever hear the news and embrace it, would be one. He did not pray that they would all be the same. He prayed that they would be one. Not that they would all agree on everything all the time, but that they would find oneness and unity in Christ and find a way to negotiate everything else. You follow me? There are differences in people. Some of those are pretty hard to reconcile. The biggest thing that we need to find in common is Christ. If we have Christ in common, everything else can be worked out. Or we can just live with it. The most important thing for us should be that everybody knows Christ. And you can't make somebody know Jesus, but you can tell them about Jesus. That you do have some control over. What happens from there is between them and God. You with? We don't all have to be the same. We don't all have to think the same. We don't all have to like the same things. We don't all have to like beef tacos. Some people like chicken tacos. Some people like corn chips. Some people like flour tortillas. You know what? I don't care. I really don't care because I like it all, so it's not hard for me. But... <laughs> You see what I'm saying? We don't have to all be the same. We don't all look alike. We don't all necessarily think alike. But if we have Jesus in common, everything else falls into place. We have to have an eternal view of other people. And we only can have an eternal view of other people if we embrace the eternal view God has given us for ourselves. If all we think about is temporary things, that's all we're going to talk about. And that's all we're going to think about and it's all we're going to, frankly, worry about is momentary things. There are eternal things that are more important. And the most, the biggest, most important eternal thing there is, is that people know Jesus. Ephesians 2.19. Nope, Ephesians 2.21. Sorry, Ephesians 2.21. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple of the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God's, where God lives by his spirit. Now we're talking about something I can understand. We're talking about building. <laughs> we are all being put together. I love this picture that Paul uses. I love Paul's writing because in just this one chapter, he's used all these word pictures, so that people who think differently and people who have different interests, they can all sort of understand what he's talking about. Here he's talking about buildings being put together. And he says, this passage paints this picture of the, what the church is supposed to be. Living stones. That may sound familiar. We are supposed to be living stones, and we are to be intricately joined together to form a dwelling place for the spirit of the Most High God on earth. Our unity is not merely a human endeavor, but it's a divine design rooted in the very nature of God. Each one of us has a place. Each one of us has a place where we fit. One of the really beautiful things about stone walls, I love stone architecture. The thing I love about stone walls as opposed to brick walls, brick walls, they're all the same. Bricks, each brick they, they go to a lot of trouble, people who make bricks, to make sure that bricks are exactly the same. And they're made by human hands. But stones, you look at a beautiful stone wall, I'm talking about a real stone wall. <laughs> There's no two stones alike. They're all unique. And you can go look over the entire building and not find two stones that are even close. Because each one is fearfully and wonderfully made shaped by a master to fit perfectly in this puzzle that becomes something much bigger than just that one piece. And that's 
how we should be viewing ourselves in the kingdom of God. We are one piece, and it doesn't look like much. You look at that, one little stone doesn't seem like a really big deal, but if you took it out, the whole thing falls down. It's got to be there. And it's fearfully made by the master exactly as it should be, and it's put in place exactly where it belongs. That is us in the kingdom of God. We are living stones, metaphorically, working, living, breathing, praying, serving, living out in the world, making God's kingdom known in the world. People say things like, I don't feel like going to church. I don't need to go to church. I've heard this. I can commune with God in the great outdoors. I don't like church. You probably heard some of that. If you've invited people to church, you may have heard some of that too. We need to remember that God created the church. Jesus instigated the church. Faith in God is a pack organization, right? We're, we are pack animals. You cannot make disciples all by yourself. You've got to have some disciples, right? Paul says elsewhere, don't give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing because we sharpen each other. Somebody brings something you don't have. You have something somebody else doesn't have. I hear people tell me, well, you know, I go to church, but it, it just doesn't feed me. Okay, I hear you. But is that really what worship is supposed to be? Feeding you? I mean, I thought you fed yourself between worship services. <laughs> and you come to worship to show God how much you love him and show one another how much you love them. We come together and we deal with one another. We don't deal. We meet one another's needs. Right? Somebody has a need. We find out about it when we are together. We love one another together. Right? You can send an email. I'm thinking about you. And I do it all the time. It's not a bad thing. But it's not the same thing as looking somebody in the eyes and embracing their hand and saying, I have been praying for you. Do you know what I'm saying? It just feels different. There's a level of commitment there. There's a level of sincerity there. Yes, maybe, I hope this is not true, but it's possible today you got nothing out of this service. But you brought something to the service that somebody else really needed. That's the kingdom of God. That's what the kingdom of God is about. Everybody does their thing. Everybody, I hate to use this, but with the stone wall thing, everybody fills in their space. Everybody has their place, their part to play. I'm just crashing all the metaphors together at once. It's kind of a finale, right? <laughs> everybody has something that they bring to God's table. That's what the kingdom of God is all about. That's what the book of Ephesians, particularly chapter 2, is all about. Jesus set up the church. He did it on purpose. And he said, to his, when his people gather, and when we meet together for worship, he manifests himself, his presence shows up in a very special way. That's not to think he's not with you when you're alone at all. But when people gather together in his name to celebrate him, he shows up in a special way. It's different. I'm not even going to try to explain that. All right, now having said that, Going to church is also not a box you check off at the week, right? There are people who go to church religiously and don't know the Lord. You understand the difference? There's religion, there's relationship. You can go check the box, sing the songs, and smile a lot, and leave, and not be changed. That can happen. I think that breaks God's heart. You have to open your heart to what he's doing. You have to let the Lord move within you. And that works very differently when we all come together. And when we make ourselves available for the needs of other people. It changes things. Right? Christianity is not about coming to the place. Christianity is about having a loving relationship with God and loving the people God loves. Even the unlovable ones. I've been known to say this. God and their mama loves them, so, you know, I better should too. 
That's not good grammar. There's no English teacher in here today, right? Yeah. <laughs> if God loves them, we love them. That's what Christians do. Unity is not a passive state. It's an active pursuit. It's not, you can't achieve it. You're either moving forward and it's getting stronger or you're falling back and it's getting weaker. There is no standing around in unity. All right, it's a continual striving toward harmony and reconciliation. Unity requires humility, patience, and most importantly, love. You got to love people if there's going to be unity. So we need to heed the timeless wisdom of Ephesians 2 and embrace the power of unity in Christ. And we need to allow God to use us as agents of reconciliation in the world. I don't know if you've noticed, the world is a mess. You catch on to that? Now, by yourself, you're not going to fix that. All of us together, we're not going to fix that. But we can make something better. We can make a difference. Individually, we can make a difference. Together, we can make a bigger difference. The biggest difference we can make is showing people what the love of God looks like. We live in a community that I don't think really gets that very well. We can do something about that. If we are unified together, when we are together, as agents of reconciliation between God and man, and letting his trans transformative power work through us. I'm going to transition now for our, the reception of our uh, tithes and our gifts. This whole thing, the church, only works if everybody's on board. Now, God will never ask for something you don't have. That I believe wholeheartedly. God will never ask for anything you don't have. But he will ask us to share what he's given us. And that could be an ability. It could be a gift. It could be uh, time. It could be place. It could be anything. Anything. But if we embrace this idea that everything we have is a gift from God... Everything that we have is a gift from God. And we were given that gift, like the Jewish people were given the law, to reflect God's love back to the world. That's our modern vernacular of that. That's our modern version of that. We are given everything that we have to reflect God's love to the world. And sometimes that's hard because people are not always lovable. I mean, I am one. People are not nice. People are cranky. I understand that. And people don't always respond to the call of Christ on their lives. That's not up to us. What's up to us is that we will share what we've been given, whatever that may be, that we will share that. Tithes and offerings is one opportunity that we have to join in the mission of the Church of the Nazarene in a very real and tangible way. You can, of course, give livingstonenaz.org if you're with us online. Uh, and lots of people, I mean, give however you want to. Don't give because I'm making, if, if I'm making you feel guilty, forget that. All right? It's a get-to situation. <laughs> All right? This is not a have-to. This is a get-to. All right? But there are things that right now we can't do because we don't have the resources we need. There are things we'd like to do that we can't do. And so if you want to get hooked in to what God is doing in this little community, then I encourage you to pray to God and just ask him what he would have you do and if he would have you hook into that mission and be a part of that and then just do what he says let's pray together Lord Jesus I thank you for this wonderful day that you have brought us together I thank you for this opportunity that we have to worship you together to reflect your glory and your wonder to the world around us I pray that you will use our gifts and our tithes in a way that is very meaningful in this community and beyond. I pray that you will inspire us in ways that we can reach the people around us, people who have no hope. Lord, we know a guy. All together now, we can make a big difference in this little community. 
if we just get all together now. So Lord, I pray that you will inspire us however you would. And may you get all the glory and honor that you deserve in us today and every day. In Jesus' name, amen.